and welcome to our Wednesday afternoon coffee chat with elder care attorney Robert Slutsky. We're very happy today to have some guest speakers. We have, we're going to begin with the community educator Ann Martinez from the Alzheimer's Association. She is a volunteer and I'll tell you a little bit about Anne. Anne is a volunteer community educator with Alzheimer's Association. She currently works as the Director of Memory Care at Park Creek Place with Enlivened Senior Living. Her passion is for providing education and support to families and caregivers. She seeks for creative ways to help serve those who are experiencing symptoms of dementia. So thank you so much, Anne, for joining us today. And we're excited to have you share some information with us about the stages of Alzheimer's and the risk factors introduction that Heather gave me, so I guess I don't need to tell you anything about myself because um, she covered it. So this education program is presented by the Alzheimer's Association. This is Understanding Alzheimer's and Dementia. Um, again, my name is Anne. If you know you have trouble hearing me or it comes up during this session, just make sure that you um, let me know. You can put it in the chat or you can hit on mute and let me know if there's any any tech issues, because we love technology, but sometimes technology can be a challenge too. Um, so this program is designed for those that are interested in learning more about Alzheimer's and other dementias. Um, we're gonna take a look at what we're going to discuss today. We're gonna take a top level look at Alzheimer's disease and dementia to give you a broad understanding. Um, by the end of today's program, we, of course, like any good program, have some learning objectives for you. Um, we will be able to compare Alzheimer's disease and dementia, recognize how Alzheimer's disease affects the brain, list the risk factors of Alzheimer's disease, identify the three stages of the disease, recognize current FDA-approved treatments that can address some symptoms of the disease, describe how scientists are working to advance research, and name some resources that are available through the Alzheimer's Association. So you may hear the terms Alzheimer's and dementia used interchangeably, um, and they're related, the terms, but they are different. In the next section, we're going to discuss both Alzheimer's and dementia and how they're related. Um, before we begin, we're going to just test your knowledge a little bit about Alzheimer's disease. If you can just put your answer in the chat. Hi. So do you think Alzheimer's is a normal part of the aging process? Is this true or false? Alzheimer's is a normal part of aging. Go ahead and stick your answer in the chat. False. I see fal falses. Excellent, excellent. You are correct. Um, Alzheimer's disease is more than just memory loss. It's a progressive and fatal disease that kills nerve cells and tissue in the brain, affecting an individual's ability to remember, think, plan, and ultimately function. All right, let's try one more. Then if you can just put your response in the chat. Okay, true or false, people younger than age 65 can get Alzheimer's disease, true or false? True, true, true. Very good. All right, you guys are on point. It is true. People younger than age 65 can develop Alzheimer's. Um, it's called younger onset. Uh, approximately 200,000 Americans younger than age 65 are living with younger onset. You may also hear the term early onset. These two terms are, are used interchangeably, early onset and younger onset. They're the same thing. Um, in some people cases, people can develop the disease as early as in their 40s or 50s. So we're going to watch a video from one of our experts, Dr. Heather Snyder, and she's going to explain how Alzheimer's and dementia are related. Dementia is the umbrella term for an individual's changes in memory, thinking, or reasoning. There are many possible causes of dementia, and Alzheimer's is the most common cause. 
Other causes of dementia are vascular dementia, which is marked by changes in the blood flow and the blood vessels in the brain. Dementia with Lewy bodies, identified by specific brain changes throughout the brain that include the buildup of a protein known as alpha-synuclein. And frontal temporal dementia, which is marked by brain cell loss in the front sections of the brain or the frontal lobe. Each type of dementia may have distinct characteristics to cause specific behaviors in the individual. But there is also some overlap in behaviors among the types of dementia. OK, so as we saw, there's many different causes of dementia. I like that umbrella term. It's a good image to kind of keep in your mind. And all the raindrops are the different types of dementia. Um, Although there are many types, Alzheimer's is the most common. About 60 to 80% of all dementia cases are caused by Alzheimer's disease. Um, each type of, of dementia has different causes and symptoms. So the, the ones that were listed there, the Lewy body, the frontotemporal lobe, these are just a few that, are, that can be under that umbrella. There are many other ones as well. Okay. We're going to, to discuss the brain because Alzheimer's is a brain disease. The brain is our most complex organ. It's also our most powerful despite weighing only about three pounds. So let's hear from one of our experts about how Alzheimer's affects the brain. More than a hundred years ago, Dr. Alice Alzheimer's described specific changes in the brain what we call the formation of plaques and tangles. Now, Alzheimer's is a progressive brain disease that's marked by these key changes and is thought to impact memory, thinking, and behavior. The brain has three main parts, the cerebrum, the cerebellum, and the brainstem. Each one plays a role in how the body functions. The cerebrum fills up most of your skull. It is part of the brain most involved in remembering problem solving, thinking, and even feelings. There are about 100 billion nerve cells or neurons throughout the brain that transmit messages in order for us to create memories, feelings, and thoughts. Alzheimer's disease causes uh, nerve cells to die, which leads to the brain tissue loss, or what we call shrinkage, and causes loss of function and communication between cells. These changes can cause the symptoms of Alzheimer's disease such as memory loss, problems with thinking, planning, behavioral issues, and even at the end stages, problems with swallowing. Okay, so again, everyone with a brain is at risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. We are going to talk about some of the risk factors. Um, one thing that I like to say is that, you know, different brains mean different disease processes. So not everyone is going to experience everything the same way, but you know there are a few things that have been shown to be risk factors. There are known risk factors that increase a person's risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. So we're gonna test your knowledge again. Again, if you could just put it in the chat. All right, which of these options do you think is the greatest risk factor for Alzheimer's disease, genetics, family history or age? Age, I see. Thank you, Patty. Anybody else? Okay, somebody said genetics. Okay, I see genetics. Okay, very good. Thank you for participating. The answer is age. Age is the greatest risk factor. Genetics are a risk factor, but age is actually the greatest. Um, these are all known risk factors. So genetics, family history, age, they're all known risk factors. However, age is the greatest known risk factor. Now let's hear for a little from one of our experts as she explains the most common risk factors. Alzheimer's disease is marked by specific brain changes that result in the clinical changes in individual experiences, that is, changes in memory, thinking, or reasoning, and ultimately, Alzheimer's is fatal. The exact cause for these changes is unknown, but there are some hints as to what may contribute to an individual's risk. 
age is the greatest known risk factor for Alzheimer's. And when we look at populations of people, we see an increased risk over the age of 65. However, Alzheimer's is not normal aging. Family history is also a known risk factor. Research has shown that those who have a parent or a sibling with Alzheimer's are more likely to develop the disease. And that risk increases if more than one family member has Alzheimer's. When we talk about the genes involved in Alzheimer's, there are two categories that could potentially be involved, risk genes and deterministic genes. Risk genes increases an individual's risk for developing the disease, but does not guarantee that they will develop Alzheimer's. Deterministic genes, which are rare for Alzheimer's, guarantee that the person will develop the disease. Okay, so again, just to be clear, Alzheimer's is not a normal part of aging, but age is the greatest known risk factor. We're also going to take a look at some populations who are at a higher risk for developing the disease. In addition to the main factors for the general population, Hispanics, African Americans, and women are at a higher risk for Alzheimer's disease. Research shows that older Hispanics are about one and a half times as likely as older whites to develop Alzheimer's and other dementias, while older African Americans are about twice as likely to develop the disease as older whites. The reason for the differences is not well understood, but researchers believe that higher rates of vascular disease in these groups may also put them at a greater risk for developing Alzheimer's disease, right? What's bad for the heart is bad for the brain generally. The reason for these, um, again, is unknown, but women are more likely than men to develop the disease. An estimated 3.4 million American women are living with the disease today. We know that women live longer than men, making them more likely to develop Alzheimer's because as we said, um, age is the greatest risk factor. However, longevity and lower death rates can only partially explain the difference. So researchers are exploring how genetic differences between men and women may impact disease risk. We're gonna look a little bit at the stages of Alzheimer's disease, um, you know, different brains, different experiences. So keep that in mind as we go through this part. Um, every disease process is a little bit different. No two individuals are going to experience the symptoms and progression of Alzheimer's disease in the same way. Everybody's different. Um, let's hear from another expert, Dr. James Hendricks, on why this is the case. One of the things that impacts our brain is all the other things that can happen to us as we age. And we know that Alzheimer's, the most common risk factor for getting Alzheimer's disease is age. But we also have lots of other things that go wrong with us as we age. And so how those other health factors impact our brain can also impact how Alzheimer's presents in other people. It's a different kind of forgetting. It really, really is. It's not just forgetting where I put my car keys. It's much deeper than that. And uh, for example, I cannot read a book. I used to be a voracious reader because by the time I turn a page, I have forgotten what I had read. And if you're reading a novel, you have to know what transpired before in order for you to continue to read on. And so I don't, I can't read a novel. So I, I've even stopped trying. Math, I, I can't do a simple tip anymore. You know, I. I sit there, I stare at it. Um, it's crazy what numbers I can't deal with anymore. Um, and in some ways, that's the, that's the disease to me. The other thing that I've increasingly been struggling with are words, um, which I've dealt with words my entire life, you know, as an avid reader, as a reporter, as a writer. Um, I, I struggle with them now. Okay, so those last two people that we heard with are people who are living in the early stage of the disease process. Symptoms will worsen over time for everyone. However, 
like we said, you know, people just progress through stages of Alzheimer's at different rates as their abilities change. On average, a person with Alzheimer's lives for four to eight years after diagnosis, but can live as long as 20 years, depending on other factors. Um, let's hear from Dr. Snyder again, as she explains the three general stages of Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's affects everyone differently. As a result, it's difficult to place a person in a specific stage of the disease. However, there are three general stages that are commonly referred to as early, middle, and late stage Alzheimer's. In a medical context, you may hear these stages referred to as mild, moderate, and severe. In the early stage of Alzheimer's, an individual may be able to function independently. However, they may start noticing more frequent memory lapses. Friends and family may also begin to notice difficulties in the person, and a healthcare provider may be able to detect problems in memory or concentration by conducting a detailed medical interview. Middle stage Alzheimer's is typically the longest stage and can last for many years. Damage to the brain cells can make it difficult to express thoughts and perform routine tasks, and this can lead to increased feelings of frustration and anger. In the final stage of the disease, an individual loses the ability to hold a conversation, control their movements, or respond to the environment around them. Cognitive skills, that is their memory, thinking, and reasoning skills, continue to decline, and this can lead to personality changes and need for round-the-clock care. Okay, so the next thing we're going to look at is FDA-approved treatments for symptoms. So we're going to start to see what you know. Again, if you can put your answer in the chat, true or false, there are several drugs available to slow down the progression of Alzheimer's disease. Is that true or false? What do you think? I see a true. I think you hope. I see a true. I see a true, true, true. Okay, let's see what the answer is. It is false. So there is nothing currently that can, um, there's no treatment to prevent, treat, or slow Alzheimer's disease. However, there are some drugs that can address the symptoms of the disease. Okay. Let's hear from Dr. Hendricks about some of the medications. There are currently several drugs that are FDA approved to treat the cognitive symptoms associated with Alzheimer's disease. Uh, they treat the, the symptoms, but they don't treat the underlying cause. So eventually people will progress, but, um, but they do treat some of the symptoms and, and help people for a time. So the first class of drugs are chol cholinesterase inhibitors. These drugs work to prevent the breakdown of acetylcholine, which is a chemical messenger found in the brain that's associated with learning and memory. There are three FDA-approved drugs that are, are in this class of drugs. There's Aricept, there's Exelon, and there's Razodyne. There's another class of drugs that uh, modulates glutamate, which is another chemical messenger in the brain that's associated with learning and memory. And this drug is called Namenda. And then there's a, a final class, which is actually a combination of cholinesterase inhibitors and glutamate modulator. And this is called Namzeric. Okay, so because everyone experiences Alzheimer's differently, these treatments work in varying degrees and they might not be effective for everyone. So an accurate diagnosis is really important to ensure that the proper treatment is prescribed. Um, drug misuse can lead to some negative side effects. Let's take a little look at advancing Alzheimer's research. In the last decade, researchers have really made enormous strides in understanding how Alzheimer's disease affects the brain. Many recent insights point towards promising new strategies for treatment, prevention, and diagnosis. This is an incredibly exciting time in Alzheimer's and dementia research. The advancements that we've made in the last decade 
to understand the disease as a continuum, meaning that the biological changes are starting a decade or more before someone is experiencing the changes in the memory and thinking. This sets the stage for possible prevention. The idea that when we have the tools to identify those individuals at the earliest time point, and when we have the interventions to target individuals at that earliest time point, we can intervene to stop or slow the progression of the disease before an individual loses their memories. I'm excited about what we're learning these days regarding lifestyle. One of those things that we've seen in the past are things like exercise and nutrition have now started to gain more momentum to indicate to us that it can change your ability to uh, slow cognitive decline. That is really the first stages of Alzheimer's disease. This may include things are like social engagement, mental um, uh, cognitive training. It can be things such as exercise. It can be nutrition. All those things are now starting to point that they will lower your risk for Alzheimer's disease. Okay, so as we heard, there's a lot of hope for where we're headed in Alzheimer's research. Um, one of the ways to keep research moving in the right direction is through clinical studies. And so let's take a look, look at an association service that can help people find studies. It's called Trial Match. Currently, more than 5 million Americans are living with Alzheimer's. By participating in clinical research, you can move us toward methods of treatment and prevention for all those affected by this devastating disease. Alzheimer's Association Trial Match is a free clinical studies matching service for those with dementia, caregivers, and healthy volunteers. To start, simply create a confidential user profile and receive a list of studies that may be a match for you. Don't just hope for a cure, help us find one. Okay, so the Alzheimer's Association, we're gonna just take a quick look at what you can find with us. Um, it's in communities across the country, providing direct service to individuals and families facing the disease. So we're going to talk about a few things that, that we can offer to help if you need it. The association is available wherever, whenever you need reliable information. There's three things I'm going to talk about today. The first one, and everyone write down this number if you need it, it is our 24-7 helpline, 800-272-3900. Um, this is an awesome resource. It's wonderful. I know I've had family members here that have told me they've called it at two o'clock in the morning and they've been able to talk to somebody and get through to somebody and been helped in, in enormously by this helpline. So the helpline is wonderful. It provides access to highly trained and knowledgeable staff who can help with education, decision-making support, crisis assistance, resource identification. They're all master's level clinicians. And again, they're available just around the clock 24 seven. So it's free of charge. Um, if you need it, use it. It's also available in more than 200 languages. The next thing is our website, which is alz.org. Often this is the first stop for individuals following a diagnosis of Alzheimer's or another dementia. It includes a, a lot of different sections, but um, specifically it breaks it down for people living with the disease, but also for caregivers. So it, it has information for both. And the last is the community resource finder. Um, this is just a wealth of community-based resources available specifically in your area. It includes like long-term care facilities, com community-based services, local association offices, um, different programs and education. And you can visit the website, which is listed right there, alz.org backslash CRF. And okay. so if you would like to join the fight, there are several ways to do that too. I'm going to let my um, partner in crime here, Samantha Sayward, talk a little bit about the walk. 
Yeah, awesome. So um, I know Christina is going to be bringing up some slides um, while she gets that up and running. I just wanted to say hello to Mary Pat and Kelly Rossellini, who are on the call today, who know all about the walk to end Alzheimer's. So it's great to see some familiar faces and hopefully I can get to know some of you all if you're interested in participating. So, um, so let me see, Christina. Sorry, I had a little tech issue. One more. No, you, that's that's COVID times, right? <laughs> So um, thanks uh, for this opportunity to talk briefly about the Walk to End Alzheimer's. Um, the Walk to End Alzheimer's is held uh, annually in more than 600 communities nationwide. The Walk to End Alzheimer's is the world's largest uh, fundraiser for Alzheimer's care support and research. This event today, um, or this event, the Walk to End Alzheimer's, allows us to be able to conduct these educational programs um, that you all were able to uh, participate in today. Um, this inspiring event calls on participants of all ages, abilities to join the fight against the disease. We're moving forward with plans to host um, the Philadelphia Walk to End Alzheimer's in person this fall. The date for the Walk to End Alzheimer's will be released in uh, about a week when the NFL schedule gets released. So we'll be promoting that um, once that date is released. Um, and I just want to say the health and safety of our participants, staff, and volunteers remain our top priority as we make decisions about the event details in your community. We'll continue to offer online options um, for people in their neighborhood. And I want to say in 2020, despite COVID-19, we were able to become the number two walk in the country um, and still the largest walk in the country with registered participants. Although we weren't in person, people walked everywhere in their communities. And now we have our sites uh, on 2021 to become the number uh, one walk in the country. So how can you participate? So um, if you take out your phone right now, you can scan that code. Um, you can either, uh, that code is just for Slutsky Elder Law and Friends Walk Team. Um, but if you're interested in joining us, you can create your own walk team or join Slutsky Elder Law and Friends today. Once you register, you'll get access to our Participant Center, which has all the fundraising resources, tools, and tips to be successful. If you register today on Team Slutsky Elder Law and Friends, you'll receive a small gift from us in the mail and you'll be entered to win um, a small purple prize pack in the mail. Um, so upcoming challenges and events that we have going on uh, our promise garden. We have a challenge going on right now. That's our promise garden pin challenge. Raise fifty dollars, you'll receive an orange pin. Raise a hundred, you'll receive all four pins. These flowers highlight and represent the diverse reasons for uh, walk participation and collectively create a dynamic, colorful, meaningful garden. On walk day, these flowers are risen high in the sky during our promise garden ceremony, symbolizing that you're not alone in this fight and promising one day that we will find that white flower, which is a cure. Participants are encouraged to take flowers home as a remembrance of the walk experience and promises made. Uh, we also have a step challenge that starts on Mother's Day with the Walk to End Alzheimer's app. The link is right there. Uh, if you like step in and you like competition, that's also a great way to engage with us. And that is my spiel. So if you have any questions, um, I'll put my information in the chat as well as right here. So if you have any questions about um, the benefits of creating a company team or you want to get started, I'm happy to help. That's it for me. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sam. And, um, and thank you so much. And so I just want to emphasize, you know, the walk is such a great way to remember someone who's uh, passed away from the disease or to honor someone who's currently living with it. So thank you to Sam for tying it all together for us as we, you know, Anne sharing about the disease and the risk factors and what we need to know and Sam showing us how we can join that fight and how we can support those that we know in the community, whether as a professional or as a family member who are dealing with it. So if we have time, Heather, I'd love to take some questions uh, for Anne. Absolutely. And thank you, Christina, for joining us as well. Christina is the program manager for the Delaware Valley chapter for the Alzheimer's Association. Thank you so much. And I, I, I'm not sure. I think um, Sam may have dropped it in the chat. I, I didn't see it since I was sharing my screen, but there is a little survey link. Um, if you're able to fill it out, it just helps the association know who was here today on the program. And this way we can also then send you the handouts that we do for this uh, session that we uh, understanding Alzheimer's adventure that we do all the time. This was a 30 minute version that Anne presented for us today, just within the time constraints, but you can always view the full 60 minute session at training.alz.org as well. 
Christina, um, it looks like people were having issues opening the form. Could you just open access to anyone who has uh, uh, the link? So, and then maybe just put it back in the chat. Absolutely. If anyone has any questions, you can feel free to unmute yourself, or if you feel more comfortable, you can stick it in the chat. I, I have a question. Um, I was hoping you were gonna ask the question of whether um, sleep is a factor in the onset or the amount the Alzheimer, uh, the effects the Alzheimer's takes on. I'm hearing a lot about that in recent years, and I'm curious about what you say or hear. So in terms of does sleep affect the onset of Alzheimer's? Like um, or does lack, lack of sleep affect the on, mm -hmm. onset of, on, on, of Alzheimer's? That's what I, I mostly hear and what I, what I hear and read about it. And it appears that it does, though I'm not, I'm not hearing that in many of the talks that I have, which surprises me. Um, there is, there is, there's tons and tons of research. So there is some research that is kind of linking that sleep, um, you know, anything that you can do. We have a program called Healthy Living in the Brain. And anything that you can do to help your brain is always a good thing. Um, there is a, I think there's an app that you can get that shows you all of the most research. Um, Christina, I don't know where your little box is, but maybe you can. Yes, I can drop that in the chat as well. And um, as Anne said, there's a lot of research going on in so many different areas with Alzheimer's disease. And so you actually go to our website as well. I'll put it in the chat, the, the research link of our website. You can look up any specific.